let's take a look at how the brain receives and processes sensory information from the environment. To get started, let's take a look at regions of the brain and the functions they provide. Let's first look at the three most major subdivisions of the brain called the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The hindbrain consists of these two purplish regions. The lowest, most bluish region is the lower portion of the brain stem, and just above that is the cerebellum. The hindbrain is the oldest, most primitive region of the brain. It connects the brain with the rest of the body and maintains basic physiological functions necessary for survival, such as respiration, heart rate, sleep, wakefulness, and coordination of movement. The midbrain, which we can see in pink, is the topmost part of the brainstem. It provides a passageway for messages traveling between the forebrain and the rest of the body via the spinal cord. It also is responsible for orienting responses to sensory stimuli. For example, if you have a ball flying at your head, you can thank the midbrain for coordinating your unconscious automatic response to duck or block the ball from hitting you before the conscious part of the brain has had a chance to process what is going on. Finally, we have the forebrain in the gold and yellow regions, and this is evolutionarily the most recent development of the brain. The forebrain consists of the smaller diencephalon, which is situated just above the midbrain, and the much larger telencephalon, or cerebrum. The forebrain handles our most complex and integrated thinking, particularly the outer cerebrum and is the region of the brain most involved in perceptual processing. Let's take a deeper look at this outer cerebrum. The first thing to note about the cerebrum is that it, along with the cerebellum of the hindbrain, is divided into two hemispheres, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. Another noteworthy characteristic of the cerebrum is that it has an outer layer to it called the cerebral cortex. Of the cerebrum, this is where our most complex thinking takes place. The cortex gets its name because cortex means bark in Latin. Like the bark on a tree, the cortex surrounds the brain as an outer layer. Do note that the coloring of this image is distorted a bit because it was taken with MRI. Typically, the outer cerebral cortex layer is a gray color and the inner portion is white such as can be seen in this figure here. The darker gray areas are actually called gray matter, and the whitish areas are called, as you might have guessed, white matter. If you look closely, you will see that the gray matter is made up of the cell bodies of neurons, and the white matter is made up of the long myelin-covered axons of these neurons. Let's take a closer look at one of these neurons. Neurons are information-carrying cells in the brain. Neurons can take on a handful of different shapes, but most neurons have a cell body that receives signals from other cells and an axon that carries and transmits its own signal to other cells. Some cells, like the one here, have myelin sheaths attached to their axons. These myelin sheaths help the electrical signals that travel along the axon to speed up so that messages can be sent faster. Anyway, axons aren't naturally white, but when they are covered in myelin, they take on a whitish color to them. So that is how we get gray matter and white matter. Gray matter consists of the decision-making cell bodies of the neurons, and white matter consists of the wiring or the connections within the brain. And here is an image of a human brain where you can see portions of gray matter and white matter. Anyway, back to our miscolored MRI image. In addition to the cerebral cortex, the cerebrum also includes some subcortical structures, so named because they lie deep within the cerebrum, beneath the cortex. Let's take a look at the brain's two subcortical systems, the limbic system and the basal ganglia.
The limbic system is one of the earliest regions of the forebrain to develop in the course of evolution. It helps process our motivation for behaviors, emotion, and memory. You'll start to notice that most structures within the brain come in pairs, one for each side. Two important limbic structures I want to point out are the amygdala and the hippocampus. The amygdala is the red almond-shaped structure in this figure, and amygdala actually means almond. The amygdala plays a big role in some of our most basic emotions, such as fear and anger. Another important limbic structure is the hippocampus, the purplish-blue structure. Hippocampus means seahorse, and it was so named because the structure actually resembles a seahorse. The hippocampus plays a major role in the formation of new memories. It also helps us with our sense of allocentric space, which has to do with where we are located within our environment. Navigating with a map, for example, makes use of allocentric space. Next, let's take a look at the other subcortical system, the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia help us form associations between our actions or other events around us and certain environmental stimuli. You may have learned about classical and operant conditioning, such as with Pavlov and his drooling dog, where he conditioned the dog to drool to the sound of a bell. That would be mediated by the basal ganglia. They also help us control our voluntary motor responses, including skeletal muscle movement and eye movements. You'll notice that the amygdala is part of both the limbic system and the basal ganglia. And another important basal ganglia structure is the thalamus, a key brain structure for sensation and perception that acts as a relay station for most sensory information. The cerebrum can also be divided into four main lobes. The frontal lobe up front, the parietal lobe on the upper sides towards the back of the head, the temporal lobe on the lower sides of the head, and the occipital lobe in the very back. The frontal lobe is in charge of our executive functions, including planning, organizing, decision making, problem solving, and reasoning. It also plays a role in our more complex emotions and emotional assessment of situations. It helps us with our fine, very controlled motor movements and motor programs, such as typing and texting, piano playing, and even speech. It is very important in the production of language. We have a specific area only within the left frontal lobe, usually, for some people it's on the right, called Broca's area, that specializes in speech production. The frontal lobe also plays a role in our sense of taste and smell. The parietal lobe's primary role is our sense of egocentric space. Different from allocentric space processed by the hippocampus, egocentric space tells us how to interact with our environment. It tells us where our bodies are in space, whether we are right side up or upside down. The parietal lobe also manages our sense of touch and helps us pay attention to the world around us. The temporal lobe helps us with the recognition of objects and plays a big role with memory formation, working closely with the hippocampus. Because it interacts with the hippocampus, it is also responsible for our sense of allocentric space. It plays a role in language comprehension, and just like the frontal lobe has a specific area just on one side for language production, the temporal lobe has a specific area called Wernicke's area for language comprehension. It, too, is typically found on the left side of the brain, but in some individuals it can be on the right. Finally, the temporal lobe helps us process sound or audition. And last but not least, the occipital lobe's primary function is simply, but very importantly, the processing of vision. I also wanted to elaborate a bit more on the cerebellum here, even though it is considered part of the hindbrain. 
The cerebellum is very important for sensory motor integration, referring to how our sensory and motor systems work together to guide our action. For example, some researchers have conducted experiments using prism goggles, which, when worn, display the world upside down. As you can imagine, when people wearing prism goggles try to walk anywhere, or reach for anything, or pretty much perform any sort of action that requires visual input, they really struggle. However, with time and a lot of practice, people eventually learn to interact with their world in the same way as if their vision were right side up. And interestingly, after adapting to the prism goggles, it takes some time to readjust to the real world once taking them off. Anyway, it is the cerebellum that is responsible for integrating our vision and motor actions. The cerebellum helps us adapt to new mappings, such as with prism goggles. It also helps with coordination, especially when we need to make quick adjustments, such as keeping ourselves from falling when we trip over a rock, and it helps with posture. And amazingly, it constitutes only 10% of the brain's mass, but contains over half of its neurons. And as I mentioned before, the cortex of the brain, the very outer layer, is responsible for our most complex processing. We can divide the cortex into the various regions that are responsible for early and more complex processing. Any regions labeled as primary cortex are the earlier, more elementary processing areas that handle the more basic dimensions of sensory information. So for example, the primary visual cortex is the first portion of the cortex to receive and process visual information and it handles the earliest stages of visual and it handles the earliest stages of visual processing such as the recognition of lines of various orientations and edges association cortex labeled in purple on the other hand is area that is more complex and integrative with our memory and past experience Visual association cortex, for example, helps us recognize whole objects and people. The last thing I'd like to mention is that each of our senses has a primary pathway in which stimuli from the environment travels from sensory receptors to that sense's primary cortex. Here we see the primary pathway for vision. Sensory receptors in the eyes respond to light and transduce that light into a neural signal the brain can understand. That neural signal exits the eyes along their optic nerves and reaches the thalamus, that sensory relay we looked at earlier. From the thalamus, the signals travel on to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobes located in the back of the brain. Each sense has its own primary pathway like this that goes from the sensory receptors all the way to the primary cortex for that sense. Now that this video is over, consider briefly writing down from memory what you have learned. This sort of practice retrieving from memory is one of the best things you can do to remember what you just learned.